guys, girls, how are you? Welcome to Vicariously Podcast. This is by far one of my favorite episodes. Uh, I've said that every time, I think. Sorry. This one is, though. This is a really, really cool dude. So we sit down today with Roger Camp. He is the uh, founder and COO, or partner and COO of Camp King, which is a media agency uh, in San Francisco. So a um, little bit of background on him. He has been in the game for 20 some years and he is by far one of the funniest people I've ever met, but he is also one of the most dialed in, business oriented, just creative minds. Um, guy doesn't sleep, he is an absolute machine and uh, it's why he's gotten to where he is. So I think that'll come through here in the podcast but um, he's worked with a ton of different brands, Old Navy, Del Taco, Sling, uh, YouTube, Ugg Boots, um, the list goes, Zeus, the list goes on and on. He also works currently with the Sacramento Kings. So uh, their agency has done a ton of creative. They actually were voted by Adweek um, for a Holiday Inn commercial that they did a couple years ago that got voted top 10 funniest commercials of all time. So pretty prestigious. He's done a, a ton of work that you would recognize. So stop by their website, which is Camp King, um, and you will probably recognize some of the commercials and some of the different marketing collateral and campaigns that have been out in the US over the past 15, 20 years. So back to Roger Camp, super good dude. I will be honest, I was actually pretty nervous for this interview. I have no idea why. Um, but he is a really good dude. He's super funny. And I think some of the stuff that will come out in this podcast or this episode is that you'll get a real sense of kind of how charismatic he is, how creative he is, and um, also his passion for, for how he's gotten to where he is. So really, really cool episode. Hope you enjoy. All right, we are sitting here with Mr. Roger Camp of Camp King Agency, something he developed and started on his own, as in the uh, co-founder, creative director, the mastermind, the genius behind it. Keep going. <laughs> so um, <laughs> we can we can talk about some projects that you've done, but specifically, I kind of wanted to dive in on on your background because I think that that's one of the pieces that um, is super interesting to to people who aren't in this world and and kind of how you've climbed the ladder so fast to the point where you're now owning, operating your own agency. Sure. Um, so just to, to go back and give the listeners any any feedback on where you started. So going through your, your history, working with uh, Wyden and Kennedy, obviously they're they're well known, most probably known for Nike, Coca-Cola, some of their major brands, um, Procter & Gamble, Verizon, not just national brands, but but global. So how was that experience? How did you kind of get tied up with them? I know that was probably your, what, second or third venture out yeah, of college? probably third or fourth. I think even going back further, the the where it all started was I loved art and I loved to do painting, drawing and all those things. And I remember there was a moment where my father went to my art teacher and uh, pulled her aside and said, can my boy make any money doing art? <laughs> and uh, she enlightened him to all the things of design and advertising that were out there. So that gave him a little reassurance, but I still didn't know I wanted advertising. I still wanted to be an artist, but truly somewhere down the line, I think what happened was I went to School of Visual Arts in New York. Um, and I was taking classes for graphic design and I mistakenly filled out um, a request for an advertising class thinking it was graphic design because I didn't know the difference. And I got in there and I was like, wait, this is fun. It's like words and pictures together and I get a little more, it, it was something a little different than, than the pure aesthetic of, of graphic design. And I was like, I love this. I want more of this. So then I turned that into my major. And then I got out of, uh, got out of college, ended up working a few places in New York, uh, working on Comedy Central, Virgin, Atlantic. Um, they were fun brands and it was a fun place. Um, and then I ended up bouncing around a few places in New York. I ended up going to Cliff Freeman and Partners, which is now no longer around. But, um, my very first TV commercial I ever filmed was for Little Caesars, the old pizza pizza stuff. And it was with Evil Knievel and, and JJ Dynamite Walker. And it was so fun. And, uh, and I truly remember at that point, I was like, this is great. Like, this is 
this is fun. This is what I want to do. And I could still say, I swear to you, like they're having a business is super stressful. Being in advertising is super stressful. But at the end of the day, like there's a, not a lot about this that feels like work. Huh. Like it's still fun. It's, and it's going to freak me out at certain times. And having my own agency, I think one of the big turns here is that the highs are higher and the lows are so much lower. Yeah. But um, it, it truly is great. So Widen & Kennedy, when it ended up, ended up at Widen & Kennedy was when I had uh, left San Francisco the first time. I started an agency, and it was right around the dot-com bubble bursting. And I went to the uh, went to Portland and worked at Widen & Kennedy and ran uh, Amazon for them. I was originally hired for Coca-Cola brands and Diet Coke. And it's great. I mean, that culture and that agency is, is phenomenal. It is truly the best agency in the world. Um, and they've proven it for years and years mm -hmm. and years. But I think what I've learned there, and I think even over my career, I've grabbed pieces and bits and parts from all the agencies I've worked at. Cliff Freeman was known for being humorous and doing a lot of comedy. But the people there all liked each other and trusted each other. And there was something about that that I wanted to bring here when I founded Camp and King. Same thing with Wyden was like, there was such a culture about the place. People would get it tattooed on them. It was insane. <laughs> it's an absolute cult. But um, they lived it, breathed it, bled it. It was, it's great. So I wanted to bring those pieces when I tried to form an agency and know like, hell, I've been, it's, I've been it lucky, lucky lucky enough to be at some of the best agencies in America. How do I learn from that and try to apply it to this? Yeah, no, that's, and, and just, just in that quick snippet, you, you touched on, so I know you're from New Jersey. You touched on school in New York. You touched on Widen, Widen Kennedy in Portland. Yep. Uh, and then your first time in San Francisco. So just out of those moves and then um, there's other there's other states in there that <laughs> there I'm leaving are. out. I ran to Minneapolis. I was at mm -hmm. Fallon, uh, which is again one of the one of the great agencies. Uh, I was at Fallon and um, ended up leaving there to come back, and that's when I went to Hal Reine, publicist and Hal Reine, um, here in San Francisco, where I met Jamie King, who is now my business partner yeah. here. So, would you say, from a travel standpoint, I don't even know how it, uh, uh, working in sports personally um, for the past whatever 13, 14 years, I've always looked at the entire U.S. as which which team do I want to work for, which yeah. which position do I want to work for, and then I fill in the blanks of do I want to live in South Dakota? No. Do I want to live in Delaware? Okay, yeah, I'll give it. I'll give that right. a shot. That's in the okay range. Right. So from your standpoint of being creative director at the time for those moves, were you looking at the company and that was it or the position and that was it? Or were you saying, mm, Minneapolis, yeah, I can get behind that. That's that's someplace I'd like to look at. So I'll look at jobs there. Yeah. It was definitely the company. And I think uh, those agencies that I went to had such storied pasts and they are so acclaimed that it was, I was going to, it was going to make it work no matter where they were. Yeah. Um, and even then, I think coming out of New York, you've got so many places where you can find a job. So it's, I, I have a ton of friends that are there and they're living there because they, they have the ability to move around. I think places like Portland and Minneapolis were much smaller in their offerings, mm -hmm. but the draw again was the name on the door, those agencies. So it was worth it for that move. And then ultimately what happened was um, my wife and I talked about we need to pick a spot and just go there and live because we were moving the kids and it was just tumultuous and just pick a spot. So when we originally came out to San Francisco from uh, New York and New Jersey, we uh, had our first daughter here and we kind of like started the family and we're like, all right, let's go back there. We had such good, let's, let's go back. So we ended up deciding that San Francisco was going to be the place we were going to move to. And that's when I started to, at the time, freelance um, and consult. And I, I, I had helped um, local friends of mine, Venables Bell, who uh, we, they were pitching Audi and I helped them pitch Audi. So at the time I had an interesting offer from them and then Hal Reine. But the Hal Reine thing proved to be a little more uh, enticing because of Jamie and I did new business with him and felt pretty invincible in a room that I can be the wacky creative guy. Yeah. And he's so strategically sound that he allowed me to be more stupid. And I mean that in the best of ways, which is I can say, what if? What if a brand does this? What if it does that? Because he's coming in with such sound strategy that it's 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 you can't argue mm -hmm. that piece of it. So one of your your role at at Publicis was was what chief uh, creative director? chief creative officer okay. yeah chief creative officer and so was he he was a the, he was the ceo CEO, or he was, okay. correct so i was cco and he was ceo so how how ronnie just to put this in perspective they have 217 offices globally they have 9000 employees 
and they are situated in 84 different countries. Which is Publicist, to be clear, the parent okay. company. Halrini is one of the companies that live yeah. under that, but absolutely, that's that's Publicist, for sure. And we dealt with all of those guys. Yeah. We were we were in bed with all of the Publicist family. So I think this is, this is a, a piece that's come up in a lot of previous conversations with the Vicariously podcast is having some sort of partner. And so um, I think that some of the stories we've heard is that you get into a company with your best friend and things can go yeah. south pretty quick because you guys started off so, so tight. Yeah. I've also heard and sat down with some people that started with the family situation and mm -hmm. that's trouble. Mm -hmm. So you guys work together. You're both very senior in your in your position there. Tell me how you kind of gelled and how you decided to start your own venture together. We had talked about it, uh, I guess, a few years in. And, and there's just under the holding company model, we were beginning to chafe. And we wanted to do our own thing because we were lining up some wins at Riney that... Um, if it had any other name, I think it would have been even more noteworthy and been on the front page of everything. We were doing really well for them. Um, but the holding company was just tough. You just had to deliver your numbers, deliver your numbers, deliver your numbers. And there was a great moment where we were on the verge of winning a big piece of Walmart. And um, Publicis and Paris um, specifically was coming back saying... If you don't convert this, we're gonna have to, we need the names of the people we're gonna cut. Cause you've got to hit we've got to <laughs> reduce salary. You've got to cut this amount. You've got to cool. hit it. <laughs> so their CFO was uh, in contact with our CFO and he was this big, he's kind of this big New York guy and he'd always run into the office and he'd be like, Paris needs your names. He, they need your names. Give them to him. And I'm like, well, just, you need to wait. Like Jamie and I both, you need to wait. We're so close to winning this. It feels good. We're, it's Walmart. It's going to be big. It's great. Give us time. Paris needs your numbers. They need the names. So eventually what happened was it, it, we had him give us the salary sheet of the number that we needed to hit. And it just happened to be the number that they wanted to cut was basically my salary and Jamie's salary. <laughs> so we wrote our names on the paper and oh. gave it back to him. And he was like, you can't do that. They're, they're going to be so pissed off. You can't do that. So did you get the business? Uh, we got the business. You got the business. We got the business all was well. We ended up doing like really good stuff. Yeah. Uh, the spot was featured on Ellen. Uh, some of the Walmart stuff was featured on Ellen as her favorite commercial. I was like, we, we, it was, it was good. It was good. So it was just another little wrinkle in the, in the adventure and getting here. Yeah. But I do think finding that partner is so crucial. Um, he, Jamie and I right now, even now, um, we are in lockstep as far as what we want this company to be, what we want the work to be. There are very few differences when we've ever really had any kind of, um, disagreements to the point where it was going to be contentious. It was, it, it, we've, this, this has been a fantastic partnership. And I think that's also a, a bit of a clear delineation of he has his role, which is strategy. Mm -hmm. Um, and my role, which is on the creative side. Mm -hmm. And we're both influence each other, we'll challenge each other in the best of ways, but it's, again, there's a clear lines of demarcation. Yeah. So uh, I'm gonna jump on it just because you said it. So you you touched on that you have the same idea and same vision right now for the company. What, what would you say that is? Oh, it's so <laughs> funny because we just had this conversation the other day. We want to be a great agency. At the end of the day, we want eclectic work and eclectic clients. I love the fact, one of the things I've always uh, tried to avoid was when I was at Cliff Freeman, it, it's a, it was a great shop, but they, they did comedy over and over and over again. Mm -hmm. And they did it really well, but that was a, it, that's what they did. And I remember at some point um, we were pitching something and I had some really good work and and Cliff Freeman looked at it and he was like, ah, that, or the client didn't buy it. And he was like, hold on to that. We'll sell it to this company, this other one that was coming in. And I just remember learning at that point, like this work is interchangeable. Cut to me going to Wyden and Kennedy where I kind of had something that was funny and it was for not a funny brand. And I remember talking to Dan Wyden and showing it to him and he was like, that that's not right for the brand. And I'm like doing jazz hands. I'm like, but it's funny. <laughs> and uh, he's like, but that's not right for who they are. And it, it was then that I learned every brand has a voice. It has a soul of who and who, how it should act and behave. Not to say that they all can't be really interesting. Yeah. Some can be funny. Some could be provocative. Some could be quirky. So I think one of the things that we're doing is trying to put together bigger clients that allow us to show our diversity. Even mm -hmm. when I hire, when I hire writers here now, I want them to be able to make you cry with something they've written. Then they're going to make you laugh and then they're going to piss you off like that. On any given day, we've got three assignments on their plate that will allow them to try and do that. I love that. <laughs> I, I, I love that. I, I think you should you can package that right there. That's solid. Um, so not to not to dwell on anything from Cliff Freeman that you brought up, but one of the things that I 
I read is so basically just to give anyone the background who doesn't know anything about them, they were in business for 22 years. Um, you started to touch on it earlier, but one of their big claim to fame was the the ad that they did with Little Caesars and the mantra of pizza, pizza. Everyone knows that one. Wendy's was another big account. So they went under in end of 2009, beginning of 2010. So some of the some of the quotes or some of the backlash that came out of that was that Cliff Freeman, 67 years old, was stuck in his ways and very um, um, very kind of bullheadish of mm-hmm. here's how it's going to go. And yeah. so I don't want to put words in your mouth, yep. but would you say that that is partially why you have developed into the way you've been? Or would you say that you're always, you've always been kind of this open, easygoing, whatever happens, maybe we can make it funny. Maybe we can just make it very artistic. Yeah. Um, I, I, truly believe, I think it was the Wyden Kennedy learning curve when I realized every brand has a voice and soul and how you manifest that and do something interesting with it it still needs to feel right and proprietary to who they are. Customized. Yeah. And I think that's the the learnings from from Cliff's was it was a great place to work when I was young. Mm -hmm. His desire to win awards and the humor that was that was being so well received at the time gave me and my career such a such a boost. Mm-hmm. And that allowed me the opportunity to end up at Wyden. And it allowed me the opportunity. I, I talked to, a, there's a bunch of friends that I came out of school with and, and some of them haven't worked at the same places. They, they, they might not have put together as big of a reel. And, and we were all funny, talented, good, but I think some, I was lucky enough to catch a few breaks and work at some of these places that allowed me to create the brain farts that I had and, and the people and people liked it and it moved business. But I would also say, I mean, knowing knowing you, knowing your brother, that's <laughs> also who you guys are. You guys have always been very uh, outgoing. I actually read something, um, which I cannot believe I found it because I thought I had some dirt on you and I was going to make a funny joke and then I got? found it that it was in ad age that you love to get naked. I, so uh, to I have a good with story my dad. with that too. Yes. With my dad. I have a, <laughs> so, so... Um, <laughs> <laughs> Should I expand or should we just leave it at that? Because it's well, funny I'll, if we just drop it. I'll tell you what my <laughs> I'll tell you what my story is. So my story is Gary um Gary came to me one day and he was and he was dying laughing and he said, Gary's got, my brother. Yes. So he, <laughs> he showed me this picture. He said, You gotta see this picture. It was you, one of your family vacations, and your mom and dad are standing on the beach and they're looking off into the, the sunset or whatever it was, and they're standing next to each other on the beach, but there's a gap of about three feet in between them, and you got butt naked and ran up in between them and gazed off into the sunset <laughs> together. And Gary snapped the picture. Yes. I been ongoing ever since. <laughs> the moment was great. It's my dad looking out at the ocean and, and I, I was like, how do I fuck with dad? Like, what can I do? Can I say fuck? Yeah. yeah. So, uh, <laughs> so then I was like, oh, I'll just get naked. So I took off my clothes. I walked up and I put my arm around him and I waited for him to kind of look over and freak <laughs> out. But he never did. He kept his eyes on the, on the horizon yeah. and he just drank his coffee. And it became comical because he never knew I was naked. And we're having a conversation about what we had for dinner and all this other random shit. And then finally, I think people had started to chuckle behind us. and we, A crowd started to gather and he finally looked over his shoulder and then back at me <laughs> and then took off running down the beach. <laughs> and then I just kind of made a r- mad dash after him, kind of holding my junk as I yeah. chased him. So it became a thing now is every vacation I found ways to make my dad really uncomfortable by getting naked. I, I love it. But that's also, I mean, that that is an extension of someone being extremely creative. So it's the wow factor. It's, it's, it's you. It's... Um, I have another funny story about your about your dad too. I stayed at your brother's house one time, and I was coming down the steps, and they said, "Will you watch Lily while um, him and his wife got ready?" I was like, "Yeah, I'll watch her." And so I walked in. I'm sitting on the floor, and she's playing. She's got the she's got the telephone in her hand, and she she calls and she goes, "Hello," and she goes through her whole thing. And she's like, "Okay, well, I'll I'll talk to you later." I said, "Who was that?" She said, "Oh, that was Grandma." I said, "What did she want?" She said, "She was looking for Granddad." It's like, oh, where's he? Is is he here? And she's like, no, I couldn't tell her where um where he was, but he's out back smoking a cigarette. <laughs> yeah, it's all freaking time. She's, I mean, you know, <laughs> two years old at this point or whatever. So funny. Um, so the creative side, obviously, you've done some really cool stuff, and and I think 
one of the pieces that I really want some folks to understand is that so you've bounced around, um, you've you've taken these these different levels of jobs and you've worked your way up fast. And I could be completely wrong on this, but in the creative industry, to me, working in sponsorship sales, it's it's always been similar to um, kind of like stand up comedy. So you sit there and you come up with these ideas and they manifest and you're so you're so into them. And you're so behind them. And then you present it and it could be a complete fucking failure yeah. or it could be a knockout. Yeah. So, I mean, the stress of that, the time consumption of that, how do you get past that? How do you how do you get to be really good at that? Some people, I, I look at people that I, I've worked for in the past and other creatives that I've admired, and I think they have this resilient ability to outright, even when shit hits the fan. So um, there's a few creative directors that I've, always admired who would be faced with something that they love that was killed and they would find a way to go back and rewrite it either give it a new flair new flavor something else to make it a little different and get it sold again like I think the hardest thing about this business sometimes is you get beaten down there's always you're always going to get sent back to the drawing board you're always going to be left scratching your head but the more you can go back and come back with something that is as good if not better is where you win so it just requires a lot of work and I mean even here we're, we're not terrible on hours at Camp King. I mean, there's there's a lot of hours put in, um, but it's not a, a sweatshop. And there's some agencies that that do that. But when it comes time to pitch and it comes time for people to deliver their work, they need to stay and do whatever it takes to get it done. Yeah. So a lot of it is is the man hours put in. A lot of it is the tenacity that you have and just truly the hunger. Mm -hmm. We've been having a lot of people um, from outside the creative department. Also, uh, we have a major minor program. So we've been taking people within the company, uh, allowing them to to, we're calling it our freshman class. And we, we found that a lot of the people here wanted to do something. They had a, a, another itch they wanted to scratch. We had a producer that wanted to go learn computer graphics. So what we're doing is we're allowing them to go pursue that. We, we give them the money to go do it. They put together their list of what courses they would take and they're allowed to go do that. So they have the desire and drive to be something even more than the job that they're doing nine to five. And then we, get, we see the benefit because we now get that thing that you do producing, but we're also going to now throw some computer graphics at you. So it's been a great program. We're in year two. That I love that. And that's basically, you just touched on um, probably the number one reason why people do leave their jobs because absolutely number, I mean, number one, they, they feel like their, their, their voice just isn't heard. Yeah. Um, and number two, it, it just gets dry and stale and, and they get better offers. And so if you're saying, come in, your voice is heard and Oh, by the way, tell us anything that you want to do or be to evolve into yeah. and we'll help you there. It's, I mean, here of all places, San Francisco with the move and, and Silicon Valley and all of the options that creative people, strategic people, um, have, it's hard. The retention's hard. Um, so we need to find everything we can both, you know, I'm, I'm very proud of the culture that we've started to create here, but programs like that, and we're trying to find other initiatives that we can do to, to make sure that people do feel invigorated and they're always challenged. When I was at Wyden, I think one of the favorite, th my favorite thing about going into Wyden and Kennedy was you never knew what you would encounter that day. Mm -hmm. You knew that you'd have different problems to solve. We'd have different ads we need to go right. We need to develop a campaign for Nike running for that, for that, all these different things. But at the same time, they had a big atrium and there would be somebody with a goat in the atrium playing the violin. <laughs> and it was just some <laughs> weird thing that somebody brought in. Yeah. And it was, that's great. Give me more <laughs> of that. Unexpected. So uh, one of the things I've also read on, on some of the stuff that you've talked about is the persistence. And so you started to touch on it earlier, but you get these ideas and you do need to tweak it and, and maybe it doesn't launch right away. How do you, how do you not get chopped down yourself? Yeah. And then also when people come to you, uh, I'm guessing that you've had some screw ups and over the years where somebody came, somebody <laughs> came to you, somebody came to you and was like, this is going to crush it. And you said no. And it ended up materializing or vice versa where yeah. they, they were timid and it ended up being great. Oh, absolutely. There've been so many times where it, you, uh, you want to go with your gut. You, you know, and a lot of times I get, I get something in my gut that has, this feels right. And it usually takes me a little longer to put it into words or explain exactly why. So then I need to go through the rationale. So even things like we're, we're doing the Energizer campaign. And one of the campaigns we initially presented, I think in, in storyboard where it's just drawn out, it didn't have the same feel as what I knew it would when it was finished with computer graphics and how vibrant and fun and, and quirky and real. And there were so many pieces that I 
knew would come through in the in the making of it. Um, so there was a hesitation when it didn't test as well as everybody had hoped, but mm. I knew that when it finally got finished, it would be great. And and that's what happened. We ended up making the we they 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 went with it. It took a little yeah. um, holding hands and jumping in together, but um, we ended up making the first batch of work, and it, it again outperformed all they had wanted. And you know, we're playing with all different media there, whether we're bringing him to life in the Snapchat filters and um, across digital, social, and and the TV spots that are now running. So you you just touched on the Snapchat and the the social media. Um, not, I won't touch on your age unless you want me to. But <laughs> I hit it forty. I, do you know I don't? I think I'm forty eight. <laughs> I, I swear to God, I'm 47 or 48, but I don't know. Somewhere in that range. On purpose, I'm thinking. Forget so me. when you first got into this game, though, it was it was all creative and it was basically passing this off and saying, here's the idea. A lot of this shit has really, really changed when you were in the yep. heart of, of leading a team or even leading a, a company. So has that been a major, major learning curve for you or has it has it? been more of all right we need to get somebody in here that can master this because i'm i'm too far behind yeah, yeah yeah i think you're you're trying to do both you're trying to definitely surround yourself with people who are smarter than you on any given day we had a, a, a pitch here the other day and I, I sat in the room with all of <laughs> all of the people that work here as they presented their different parts and i was there was the sense of pride and holy shit these guys are on my team i was just it's it's fantastic when it all works out. So we brought, uh, we would bring in outside people to help us evolve. And whether they were areas of specialty, um, it's the same way you'd hire a director to do commercials. We're hiring different people for different needs. Um, but I've always loved the ability. And I think what's happened is when I started out, it was all television. It was all print, outdoor. Um, and now it's fragmented so much with social um, and influencers and all those things. But what that allows you to do is when you have the core idea for a brand, you can drive it through all these other touch points. So now we can do something that's going to be Snapchat. We can hire influencers to go talk about UGG for yeah. men is something we were just doing. And we sent out personalized UGGs to a hundred different celebrities. And all we're doing right there is just getting in the hopes a few of them are going to, you know, on their own social channel, start to talk about it. And they yeah. have. We've had Dwayne Wade pick up a few things. It's It's been really good, but the, also coming from Tom Brady helps. Um, but I've, I've we heard just, of him. Yeah, we just launched <laughs> with that. He was in our last campaign. We had him and Jeff Bridges. But um, being able to take that that idea and for UGG, it was do nothing. So when you have an idea like do nothing, and that's for their slippers. When you think about what you do with those slippers, and, and even Tom himself, there's a great photo that he's put out on his social media of his his legs up. It's it, the idea of do nothing, which is counter to all the other, you know, just do it and bust your ass and run and work. So there was something very counter about it that I loved. Um, we've also then take that idea of do nothing and we sponsored um, the penalty box at uh, the Islanders. I think the Islanders and Bruins. So the penalty box is the do nothing zone. Mm -hmm. um, the influencer program we've done, there's been a, a number of different pieces that we could take that idea of do nothing, which is so simple, and then drive that in, have fun with it. So I, I'm glad you brought that up because that not to not to negate on any of the other programs that you've done but um, or campaigns that you currently mm -hmm. have in market, but the UG one is... I fucking love it. Like Good. I've watched all the videos. Good. I think it's phenomenal. <laughs> if, I'm a fragile man. Keep and, saying that. If anyone who's listening to this hasn't go to the go to the website, check it out. Um, because the there's a ton of commercials and Jeff Bridges is hysterical. Tom Brady's actually really funny in it. I'm a uh, from Baltimore, so we kind of ah, a hater. Anyways, but he's the man. He's he's obviously the man, and um, all the videos are phenomenal. So just to from a sheer ignorance standpoint give us kind of the top line look of how that whole process goes through and i know that's that's it takes a long time and yeah. and months and probably even years of of getting tight with that client but just on a top level go through so you th there's an rfp a request for proposal yep i'm sure and then so what happened was i think they were looking for something to move the needle on men's this is specifically men's division of Uggs. And started probably how long ago? They've had that for a long time, okay. but they haven't really devoted the same amount of money to it, obviously, as women's. And I think one of the things that they were having a really hard time doing was getting men to wear Uggs because it's seen as a more feminine brand. Mm -hmm. So how do you do that? And they they had Tom Brady on their roster. They were already using him. So part of it was, we've got Tom Brady. What can we do with him? More than just a fashion shoot, which they had been doing for a long time, um, what can we do that's actually going to be a little more sticky? So that's where we got... 
uh, and said, okay, we've got Tom Brady. What if we, we started going through all the things. If we're, if we're going to do run stunts where you can hang out with Tom Brady or do some other fun, do, you know, do nothing kind of ideas with Tom. We wanted to actually have Tom Brady and whoever would win this contest, just play hungry, hungry hippos just for whatever it's like an hour. <laughs> um, <laughs> but so then you have this idea and we, we said, all right, let's now bring in somebody like Jeff Bridges, who I think is, you know, uh, a, a titan of movies. Yeah. And he's so revered through the Big Lebowski and everybody from, you know, he's got that cult thing of like all old people like me know him, all up and young people know him just because of that. So I think he, he crossed a lot of lines for us. Um, and demographics. So we were able to bring him in, partner the, them up together. And I think the best, I, 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 sorry to say this, Mr. Brady, but the best thing about all of this was when he was had that four weeks suspension and he was sitting out and we came out with a fucking campaign that said, do nothing. <laughs> do nothing, sit around with your and feet And he was sleeping up. on the couch. So I think that... <laughs> That all was very fortuitous with that. We, we launched this campaign at a time and even the idea of the, the do nothing idea came out at a time when Tom was sitting. So that, that also had a lot of PR um, pickup. Ideal. Yeah. <laughs> but it, going through the process was, uh, it's, yeah. it's going through Tom and his people and his agents and there, been, there were so many people involved to get, you know, the ideas yeah. through. And, you know, for the five we ended up making, there were 50 to 75 that we had proposed. Really? Mm -hmm. So then they, so you propose all these different ideas and then the, it's on the client to actually zero in and say, fine tune these five, 10. Yeah. It's working with the client. Um, but also with, with the, the talent. Okay. Cause I think somebody like Tom and I, again, I've worked on, I've worked with Tiger Woods and, and done some, some Nike and EA sports stuff. Um, some of those guys really want to be involved. Others mm -hmm. are happy just to show up and say, tell me what to say. And if my agent isn't, yeah you know, averse to this, I'm happy to jump in, but uh, some people want to be more involved. And Tom and had a team that, you know, was also throwing in some ideas. Mm -hmm. So navigating through that and finding the best ones. So staying on the staying on the football theme, um, I know of at least, I think, two Super Bowl ads that you've been a part of, the, the gerbils one with Outpost.com. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then you had one this past year, is that no, right? No, no, it was that, that, that Outpost one, which, um, again, that's one of those that was in the wild, wild west of dot-com time, and the client was Outpost.com, and they simply wanted uh, people to click <laughs> and go to their site. So it was all just about about clicks and uh, name awareness, which at the time you had everybody that was coming out of the woodwork. This the, the guy who had founded Outpost, I remember there was a moment where we, as the creative team, turned to the one guy in the room who was a planner who had actual stock in Outpost.com. And we're like, we've got this campaign, which is quiet and smart and good. And we've got this outrageous one where we're going to shoot gerbils, fake gerbils, through, a, through the O in Outpost so you remember our name. What one do you want? Your money's on the line. What do you think? <laughs> and uh, he said he wanted the louder one, and we pushed for the louder one, and they bought the louder one. And I think that it was the uh, the fun of what that it's been heralded as you know that the the, the epitome of dot com uh, craziness. Mm -hmm. But it was it it was it was an insane time where you were just trying. It was a short, fast race. I remember saying you know talking in those words to client. Yeah. It was just a, we were all under the under the drunken spell of the dot com era. So so what would you say as of today? What is your and I know this is probably a tough question, but what is your most heralded ad? or campaign to date? What is the one that, that the you're... The one that I like the most? Yeah. Um, I, uh, I don't know. I, I truly turn back and say it's this place and the people and the things that we're starting yeah. to do. I could look back and say, God, that working on um, the outpost thing was incredibly fun mm -hmm. at the time. Um, I could point to some of the Nike work or EA with Tiger. Uh, all those were, were, were really culturally fun. I think one of the things that I've always, even now, there, there's a desire that you create something that gets quoted on SportsCenter. Yeah. That's when you know you've, you've hit it. You've made it. Yeah. Which I, I was lucky enough to have with uh, the early Little Caesar stuff. Nice. Yeah. So just to, just to, to kind of recap before I go into these last couple questions for you, but my favorite thing about, about this whole atmosphere right now is obviously you, you've 
you've done very well. You've you've built up this agency, and you feel you come across very original, and you come across. Um, I'm a dick. <laughs> just so you know, <laughs> yeah, at least you're original. <laughs> um, it's it's very organic. It's very you. Yeah. Um, it's so so just to give the setting. Um, probably my favorite part about this whole thing is that. San Francisco is on fire right now. It, it is out of control from a real estate standpoint. The traffic is fucking ridiculous. It's inundated with people. And here we are sitting in the outskirts in the gorgeous Presidio overlooking Alcatraz on the right and Golden Gate Bridge on the left. A park is right situated next to the office. I walk in here today and the girl at the front desk has headphones on and is dressed casually and she takes her headphones off and she says, do you want coffee or water or whatever? I said, yeah. She takes me back to the kitchen. She points to the coffee pot, gives me a coffee mug, and said, if you want milk or half and half, it's in the kitchen, which is fucking great. Like Client that, service that, here. That's awesome. <laughs> but that's how it should be. Like, I don't need hand yeah, holding. Yeah. I don't want your your mm-hmm. person at the front desk in a, in a stuffy outfit. We talked about the, the thunder cloud that you have. And the, <laughs> yes. We talked about that. So cloud. we talked about normal people stuff. It's, yeah. it's very natural. It's very comfortable here. And I think that that shines through. And it's obviously... You've taken pieces from these these major agencies, yeah. and you've taken some pros and cons along the way, and you've yeah. you've morphed Absolutely. into this. So, since it is very unique, and since it is you, what what keeps you up at night? What's the what are the what are the stress levels right now of being this business owner or agency owner? It's the spinning plates, making sure that we're doing the best work we can for our clients, and then it is how do we make it better. So what keeps me up at night is, is there something that I could do or say or push that will reap better rewards, results for the clients, do better work, insert ourselves into pop culture Mm -hmm. on our client's behalf and find something that is relevant to them and, 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 and again, make sure that we're doing the best we can for them and making sure that we're meeting whatever goals they have, but also doing it with our own flair and unique, um, look at the world. Mm -hmm. I love, I love that answer. I'm not blowing smoke up your ass because, (laughs) because here's the thing in your world, you, you're only as good as, as the, the client stable yeah. that you case have. Case studies, case studies, case studies. That's exactly. all we say when we talk about clients coming in. And so when you when you went into this venture, it's completely predicated on you having this this stable of, of clients. And your answer wasn't, well, we need more clients or we need to make sure we hang on to the ones we have. Your response is, is just we need to stay relevant. We need to, we need yeah. to be delivering the best to these people. Yep. So... Um, all right, so I got a, a couple questions for you here. Hit it. What do we got? So what would you tell the 25-year-old you looking back? Hmm. I like the pause. That means either it's a good question or, or you're a real animal back then. Oh, you know what? I, I've said this before. It, you're talking career-wise, 25-year-old career me. We'll say yes because yeah. that's easier. <laughs> I think the thing that I would point to is um, it's amazing how uh, don't burn bridges. I think what happens is as a young creative, you, you come out of the gates and everything is so important. Every little banner ad is so important. And you realize at a certain level, if I do this banner ad, which is going to go out there and it'll, again, serve its purpose, I then buy some goodwill and a client relationship that allows me to push a weird social idea that I might have. Or... Um, it. it Making sure that I look back over my career, there are certain, when I was just a dumb asshole where I made a burned a bridge and all that stuff, it's so incestuous, it will come back. Mm-hmm. Somebody will know somebody that will know something. 99% I've been lucky enough that I haven't screwed everybody over, but um, I would say the relationships you make will last forever. And some of the greatest people that are running businesses and agencies at this point um, have kept those relationships and um, haven't been pure assholes. Yeah. No, I, I completely agree. That was a dumb question. What <laughs> else you got? <laughs> so, <laughs> so from a uh, since you've been in, in this world for so long and you obviously have a lot of friends within the same industry, who is, uh, from a client standpoint or from a from an agency standpoint, who is doing something right now that you look at and you're like, man, that's, that's awesome. I wish I had thought of that. They are nailing it with that campaign or that brand or... Yeah. I, I think Wyden, I mentioned them, they're consistently um, 
delivered on cultural relevance and they get big clients that give them the stage, but they also get the the, the rope to go hang themselves. Yeah. And they've done a great job on a lot of brands. So I, I do give them a lot of credit. Um, I also look at brands like uh, Red Bull. Red Bull is a great one to me, which is you take what that brand is about and then it manifests in the Felix Bumgarner jumping out of the fucking balloon and had the eyes of the world on it. Like that is the yeah. best representation of what that brand is. And then they've got their their other races and all the other pieces that they do that are part of it. But it's one of those where you're like, holy shit, that brand is not doing ads. They're doing events that represent what the DNA of that brand stands for. Yeah. So there's there's brands like that that I love. P&G has done some great stuff. And maybe that's the widen thing, but they've done some really interesting stuff um, that started to get to the bigger, not just the not just the product benefit, but what is a bigger claim that P and G can make. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of times that's a very slippery slope because you'll end up creating something that's schmaltzy and bullshitty. But to strike a chord as they did with the, the moms stuff yeah. that they had done around the Olympics was great. Have you ever, and this is, I'll, I'll give a personal story before you answer this, but have you ever run into a brand or a, or a campaign or, or anything that you were, you just personally couldn't stomach getting behind. And the, the reason I bring it up is because I remember working in NASCAR, we did a we did a deal with uh, Hershey's milk and milkshakes. Yeah, yeah. And the downfall was that each so it was it was tailored towards kids for the most part and, and kind of teens. And each bottle was like thirty eight grams of mm. of fat right. and right, twenty four right, right. such. Um, it was just it was it was only lasted for like eight months on the market because it was just so terrible. But I mean, we got seven figure deal out of them yeah. and we pushed the hell out of it and yep. we marketed it for the whole months leading up to our race weekend. And then that race and um, they ended up gaining distribution up and down the mid Atlantic region with this. And it was one of those ones where like once it was done and it passed, you, you, you know, you, dirty. you got your bonus check, yeah, but yeah, you, yeah. <laughs> you weren't that happy. I get it all depends on like pizza. It could be, I don't know. Is that, contributing to obesity. I look at Coca-Cola. I mean, you're selling sugar water for God's sakes. Um, there's, but I've been lucky enough not to be put on some of those that I would say are red flags. It's never been cigarettes. And then it's also some of the fun things we get to do, which is to buy our soul back. So after you're done selling sugar water for a while, to, to do something that is pro bono, we do have the ability to do that. And as an as an agency and industry, I think we've been doing it pretty well. Mm -hmm. Usually, sadly, a lot of it, it's just wrapped up for award shows, but a lot of, some yeah. of it is altruistic and good. So I think um, we also, some of the, you know, there, there's been pieces that I could go back in my career and say, oh my God, I sold Diet Coke forever, but then I did this City of Hope campaign for, yeah. you know, people with cancer. So again, it's maybe just me validating when I get to the pearly gates, how I don't get sent immediately <laughs> to hell. I think you're good. <laughs> so we'll wrap up with this. It's it's almost Christmas time. I know that you're staying out here. You're not headed back back yeah, east. That is but true. Sorry, so, mom. <laughs> I'll tell them hi. Yeah, um, please do. So two personal questions. Uh, one is, what are you looking forward to getting for Christmas, or what did you ask for for Christmas? I don't want anything. Nice. I swear to God, I don't want anything. Um, I want to get away. Um, we're going to take a trip uh, to Vegas, and then I'm going to go ride uh, dune buggies uh, with my boy. Out in the desert. That in Pismo Beach. Oh, gonna nice. It's going to be so fun. So that's what I'm looking forward to. Very cool. Yeah. And um, just in case we sit down again down in the future, what can people expect uh, what's on the horizon for you guys? What's what's kind of coming to market, or what can we expect to see in the in the next handful of months? Uh, we just won Dish Network, so we're going to be doing uh, more. We're going to be doing Dish work. That'll be breaking. We've got a new Remax campaign that's coming out. A new uh, some more Energizer work that's happening and then we just started working with um amazon prime nice so that's another one all those are scheduled for remax is coming out now but a bunch of those will be coming out in the next few months i gotta pull this up because it's uh, you just said it and um i saw it this i saw it this morning talk about the change um from brick and mortar so i saw i saw this uh, infographic. So looking at brick and mortar retail market value from 2006 yeah. versus today. Um, and I love it because most of your camp, most of your, your brands are, are tailed towards yeah. not these brick yeah. and mortar, they're yeah. e-commerce. So anyway, so looking at Best Buy, Best Buy's market value back in 2006 was 28.4 billion today, a 50% 
decrease down to 14. Another one, JCPenney, 18 billion down to 3 billion. Sears, 27.8 billion down to 1.3 billion. And Amazon in 2006, 17.5 billion with a 1,910% growth uh, estimated retail value of 351.8 billion. Yep. Talk about e commerce. Yep. It's insane. Amazon. So I worked, I led the Amazon work when I was at Wyden and Kennedy. And it was at a time years ago when it was, it was with Jeff Bezos was in the, in the room and we were doing a campaign that was touting the benefits of Amazon. So around the holidays, you don't have to sh- wait and find a parking spot and it's not this and all the all the bullshit around the holidays and shopping and all the the agita and we were testing against when they were they were thinking of launching uh free shipping and talk about like what represents a brand and i remember at the time we're going like all right we have to do this campaign and we'll 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 do it and we got like a great director he did a bunch of super bowl spots we ended up doing some fun stuff for them that i in my heart i'm going like that free shipping is, that's good. You should do that. Um, and what happened was the campaign we ran and the free shipping that they started to tout were on par. They were there, they were kind of equal. Mm-hmm. So he ended up putting all of his money behind free shipping, which is great. It was the right thing to do. So that's the one where a brand was behaving in a way and spending the money, not in advertising, but through how they present themselves. Wow. And that's great. Like when a brand does that, that who needs advertising? They still need you. (laughs) (laughs) Well, awesome. I really appreciate it, man. It has been a pleasure and I hope everyone enjoyed that. Thank you very much. Thank you, my friend.